do is to help us glory in a redeemer. And again, not just hearing about him, and this is so important, but glorying in him. How do we get to that step where we're not just learning stuff about Jesus, but we are realizing that we are moving in a position to be engaging with him with our hearts lifted? That's part of why we've got the book of Ruth here. This is deeply personal, and by walking through this story, we will see and taste and, dare I say, lean into this God of this character who is a redeemer. Now, I've got to be very careful in the way that I preach this because this has a tone to it, this story. And I think it's got a tone that isn't quite my personality. If my personality is loud, this one is quiet, gentle, and thoughtful. For those of you who know me, do you put those adjectives next to my name? (laughs) Probably not. But I'm going to try my best. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for us? Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you that you speak. And you speak the kinds of words that are fitting for the moment that we're in. And so we pray, that, Lord, that you would speak in a tone that is in keeping with yourself. And would you give us a joy in, in sitting in that and hearing from you as we explore this beautiful ancient part of your word that speaks 100% up to date. Would you direct us so that we can glory in who Jesus is? For his fingerprints and his character are are all over this. Help us, speaker and hearer alike. We need you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. So Ruth and chapter 2. Where do I start? I start with, um, I, I sort of on my YouTube feed, it sort of automatically chucks in thumbnails of things that for some reason... Um it thinks that I will find interesting. And I I do quite a bit of cultural analysis and I like those kind of podcasts and interviews. And one caught my eye, it was a little thumbnail that popped up and this is what it said. I have become invisible. I was like, oh, this looks interesting. So I clicked on it and I followed the interview of 56 year old former supermodel Polina Poriskova. Can you remember her from the late 80s and the early 90s? No. She was the face of just about everything. Uh, She packed in a modeling career in her early 30s and uh, she got married, moved on, and she was out of the public limelight. But she's sort of back in the public limelight now, primarily because, very sadly, about a year ago, she lost her husband. She is now uh, a 56-year-old widow And the title of the thumbnail was really the theme of what was being spoken about. I have become invisible. And part of the reason that it caught my attention was because it is almost a carbon copy of a sentence that was spoken to me that really struck me a number of years ago when I spoke with a a lady, a pastor's wife, her and her husband, they just moved into retirement. And as a, as a youngish pastor, I was just trying to find out what life and ministry looks like and just generally sit with a, a wise woman, get some words of wisdom. And I just, I, I can't quite remember the context and take this question out of the context. It sounds really weird, but I'm, it seemed to fit at the time. And I, I remember the, the question that I put to her was basically this. What is it like to grow old as a lady? <laughs> See? And her answer to me straight away was, you have to get used to becoming invisible. Now, that really got me thinking. Now, what's the opposite of invisible? Visible. What would you say is a good way of describing what we're talking about? What other words could we throw in there? Being seen. seen. Good. What else? Sorry? Recognized. I like that one. What else? Being acknowledged. Good. Noticed. You've had two goes. <laughs> Included. Somebody else. Valued or validated. I'm really glad you said that. Influential. So, in other words, you've got some sort of standing. You're noticed, you matter to somebody. 
One of the uh, Puritan words for this, or, and it even pops up in the, in the Bible, would be to be regarded, to be noticed, to matter. Do you get the concept of that? And if you notice how our relationship to that is very important to us, and it's something that you can't have without another set of eyes or another person somewhere around. I was learning things from Amy uh, this weekend about the nature of Instagram, and the, the reason I was asking her about it is because that supermodel had talked about the whole Instagram phenomenon, that if that had been around when she was younger, she would have been getting likes left, right, and center, getting followed by countless other people. So, uh, and, and what... Um, what Paulina said in her interview is, and I quote, people go on Instagram to be, what would you add on the end of that? Seen. And inside of that carries that whole idea of, of being noticed, of mattering, of getting some sort of validation, of, of, of somebody recognizing that you matter. And of course, the nature of the Instagram thing is it was all around visual image. So what I learned from Amy is that increasingly less teenage girls are posting on Instagram. They still follow and look and check, but they don't post. Why do you think they don't post? They don't post pictures of themselves. Why do you think that is? Others can judge me. Good. Let's riff on that idea. Not, don't think they're good enough, don't fit the ideal, and if that's the case, if you do not fit the ideal, and you are publicly up there being seen, is that the kind of being seen, being noticed, that you want? No. So I realise as well that I'm talking to people in this room who either at the moment or at a period in your life, you're really happy not to be visible. In fact, you go out of your way hoping that people won't see you. And sometimes that's because you fear that if they do, what might happen? You get rejected. Because you don't fit. For others of you, and other for, for people who perhaps like the idea of being invisible, it's related to the fact that in the past you've been hurt. And the world is a scary place, and the idea of being seen terrifies you. Haven't we got this strange relationship, this strange thing where we have a desire to matter to somebody, to be validated, to be seen, yet at the same time, it's a dangerous thing to go after. At the center of the passage today is what happens when you are noticed by the only set of eyes that really matter. And I want to tell you that this could be transformative for us in this regard because we sort of instinctively have these categories messing around and floating around in our head. Very rarely do we slow down so that we can become more conscious of deciding who we want to be noticed by. For some of us, it's going to feel a bit scary. For some of us, it's going to be full of hope. I hope we all get to the hope bit. And the way that we're going to get there is through the gentleness of this story that is just so heartwarming. It will, if ever you've wanted to be noticed, matter, be regarded, know that you've not been forgotten, not been rejected, not been cancelled, that there is one who is present and with you and for you, not on the basis of the thing that you bring to the deal, but because of the nature of what that person and what that one is like, then this is the place for us to be. Now, having said that, let's get into it. Oh, I can't, can I? Because some of you missed last week. So let's bring us up to date in the story. Shout out, what did Elimelech and Naomi do? They left the house of bread, and where did they go? Moab. Moab. They left and went into a land of compromise. What I want you to think of is the story of the prodigal son. No, nope. we're in a desperate situation. We want to go to a better place. Which of us have not asked that question when we've been struggling? There's got to be a better place out there. And so they intend to head to a better place. 
and then starts a 10-year nightmare of loss. Their two sons marry, Elimelech himself dies, the two sons die, and there are three women who are left without support, without safety. They'll be wearing the garbs of those who are grieving. They would have not been marketable in the eyes of the world. And add to that, there's a famine. But in bravery and desperation, Naomi says, I'm heading back to the place known as the house of bread. I've heard that God is on the move, and I'm going to dare to risk it for a biscuit and believe and go again. But she gets a bit of a wobble partway through, doesn't she? As that she's tracking in the direction of Bethlehem across the border from Moab into Judah. And she turns to Ruth and says, listen, it'll be better elsewhere. We see the frailty of faith, the confusion, the Lord is sort of there, but sort of not. This is the real stuff of life. And Ruth says, I'm going to cling to you. And she makes one of the most moving conversion and statements of faithfulness to bet her life on the living God that you will find in the whole of the Bible. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. I'll even push it further. Where you are buried, I'll be buried. And so she takes her life and her future in her hands and she heads over as a widow, as a foreigner, as an enemy of the people and she banks it all on this seemingly out of reach promise that there is a Lord who is full of grace and compassion and mercy and maybe, just maybe, if I draw near to him, a better day will come. And the author sets it up in such a way that we sense both the presence and the hiddenness of God. Do you know what I mean by that? His fingerprints are over every moment, but when you're living and walking through it, he feels hidden. Do you know what I'm talking about that? At that? Has anybody actually seen God in the sky this week? And yet you have to carry on with your life. And it can feel like he's not there and he's not pro- present. His hiddenness, it's mysterious. And what we're going to see here is at times when it feels like he's furthest from us, we can feel unnoticed, like he doesn't care, but he's actually setting up the stage to demonstrate his faithfulness. And the storyteller wants us to get this strange ideal, and maybe this is a a drop of dew from heaven for you, and I want you to dare to believe it, because it's not easy. It's easy to chuck it out as a theological statement, but to, to invite you to lean into it, it is this. God sovereignly ordains sorrowful tragedy to set the scene for surprising triumph. Not just so that you are a victor, no, no, so that you get caught up in his victory, his big story. Does he really notice me like that? Well, let's see. So let's dig in at verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. Now, this isn't unimportant because back the way that the first, not the first century, uh, In early Israelite history, the way that society was structured was around families, clans, and tribes. So you had a big responsibility over your family, but your family was connected into your clan. And that's sort of like a little network. And then those clans grouped together to form a tribe. And so if you were in trouble, if you faced problems, to have a family or a clan was hugely important. But as you move in this direction, the ties become a bit looser, and so there's more risk. Had Naomi and Ruth got a family at the moment? But they're connected to a clan. And the question becomes, will that clan recognize them, offer them some sort of future? So we find in verse 1, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of, what does it say? Standing. Now sometimes that can be in terms of financial standing. But people who look into this, um, they would argue that the idea of standing is about character, about dignity. So suddenly the story is turning up. 
Now they knew of him, but did they know him? No. Could it be that there is a knight in shining armor? And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up those leftover grain, the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And of all of a sudden, this woman, probably in her 20s, a foreigner in a land that was incredibly predictable. Remember, this was at the time of the judges when there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So in other words, there was a standard in their history that nobody adhered to, so you never knew what you were going to get. She doesn't sit there under a blanket watching daytime telly, chugging ice cream and eating Doritos. She dares to move out. Remember, a woman in that culture, working on her own, was a target. Not only that, she was a foreigner. So in the eyes of many, she would be scum. But she decides to speculatively head out in the direction of the fields, not knowing where she was going. In fact, she asks her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law, as we know, is in some sort of a state of depression. And she's like, oh, just have a go. And she goes out there, and you can imagine her trudging that morning. She's got some sort of receptacle in the hope that she will be able to get something to eat. Remember, she needs food and she needs family. She's got neither. There's a clan somewhere. She doesn't know where. And even if they'd step up at all, she's got a little receptacle. She's probably still got clothing on that marks the fact that she's a widow. And she goes out. Can you imagine the self-talk in her head? This is a bad idea. Oh, dear. I wish I'd got a taser with me. What kind of people am I going to meet? Who am I going to bump into? And as she walks out, it doesn't tell us whether she prayed or not. But I can't help but wonder. One of them little arrow prayers goes up. And then we find ourselves in verse 3, which is staggering. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. What's the next phrase? She happened to. What are we supposed to take from that? Of all the places, as it turned out, literally in the, uh, in the original, the idea carries, it basically means the chance chance. What are the chances of that happening? As it would happen, as if by magic, luck. And the author intends us to see this, that there is a hidden hand of providence. You know providence? It's that Bible word, Christian jargon word, which basically speaks about a plan behind the scenes of a personal God. Not fate. Not fate. An impersonal force that isn't aiming in a particular direction. But a personal God who has an eye on people and is taking them to a place. So this is no effort Oh, sorry, uh, accident. No accident at all. That there is a story behind every story down to the smallest detail of every person's life that adds up in a mysterious way into the purposes of God. And she wasn't missed out of this. This was included. As it turned out, as if by magic, she found herself like <laughs> working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, do you see this strange thing that is happening here? She could have slumped and done nothing, but she seized a moment, and the Lord was there directing and working in that. She did it when she didn't feel good. She did it when things weren't going for her. There was one who was present and working, even though she didn't see it, but she acted as if it could be a possibility. Now, this is one of the wonderful things that as a church family together, we get to be a part of, because we all know moments and times in our lives when we felt, what is the point? My life isn't going the way I want it to. This doesn't feel right. I faced another little mini disaster, and it feels awesome. And what we do is we come alongside one another in those moments, don't we? And we try to change the horizon and say, let's remember that you have one who is closer than you realize, who knows your situation, 
And there is probably some grace in here that we don't even know about. She seizes a moment and dares to consider the possibility that grace could come at her. And this is what we find. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. And so I need to invite you to do something. I need to invite you to rest in his orchestrated control. The control of a merciful and good God who says it just so happened with a wink. Now, do you find this hard? Anybody there? Okay. I know you find this hard. Why do you find this hard? Because you like to feel in control of your life. You like to know all the details. You're like, can I have an advanced copy of the script, please? Did she know what was going to happen? No. And this is the challenge and the adventure of the life of faith. And it makes me feel so bad that this Moabitess was out there seizing this moment when so often something disappoints me, gets in the way of my plans, and I'm sitting there pouting going, oh, poor me. And in that moment, I become functionally atheistic. I take God out of the picture. Do I really believe that he is working things out for his glory, the good of his people, to invite them into a greater story that is all tied up with Jesus the Messiah? And the sad indictment that you could write over me, and I know I can write over you, is that we leave him out. We put him in a box. We say nothing good could come on on us. And I love the creative imagination in the story. You know, they're in a field. It's just so mundane, but it's so exciting. The best authors in the world, some of the reasons why we like their books is because they weave this intricate story where strands come together. Where do they get that from? Who do they learn that from? Who's that an echo of? The living God, who knows how to put a story together. Nothing happens by chance. He sovereignly ordains even sorrowful tragedies because he's setting people up for surprising triumphs centered around his purposes in Jesus Christ. So are you reflecting right now? Right now as you listen to this, are you thinking about some of the ways in which you've had moments where you're like, he's really not present. And as I've gone through that process this week, I've just said, shame on me. (laughs) Lord, help me to grow my faith. Help me to believe that a just so happens is always happening. My problem is I just don't have the eyes to see it. You're there, your mercy is present again and again and again. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage. Maybe (sighs) sins that you've committed against other people are having terrible ramifications. Maybe you can't see any potential. Maybe a particular... Desire is unfulfilled and it feels like a death to you. Every moment one door is closing, it's perhaps because he wants us to lean into him and something else in another direction. And so into verse 4, just then, or in some of them, it's like, and behold, Boaz, bam, bam, bam. Behold, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. And, the, and ble- uh, the Lord bless you. So here was a dude who was spir- uh, transparently spiritual. Don't they annoy you? Like, come up to you and give you a big hug. And uh, may the Lord bless you. And uh, I don't mind telling you that I don't, I, I mean, I try and I aspire to be like that. But some of my mates who aren't believers, they get really annoyed when I just bring God's stuff in straight away. Because I can't bear the thought that we're going to live pu- purely on a hol- horizontal plane. He was a man of standing and of character, and he was trying to live out of this framework. Is that something we want to encourage one another to do? Of course it is. So the next time you bump into somebody who's not expecting it, maybe it's even somebody in here, just say, the Lord bless you today. And immediately you've started your interaction, not just on a horizontal, but a vertical. We're seeing the caliber of this guy. And by the way, those kind of people tend to have the best stories and testimonies of the Lord doing something. We need to be almost Pentecostal. Yeah, let's be Pentecostal. The Lord is always doing something, and you can set yourself up to be part of that story. 
Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? What's strange about that sentence? Whose young woman is that? Yeah, it's not who is that. Because in that culture, you were viewed by who you were connected to. And he's not asking this in a hubba hubba. She hadn't shaved her armpits. She looked a state. This isn't a romantic thing. This is a, who does that person, who is she connected to and into? It's in fact quite a religious question. We find the answer to that, verse 6. The foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. You know what all the town's been whispering about the last few days? That's her. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. Oh, by the way, you, what you can't see in that is that phrase. I, this is why I love Ruth. That phrase basically, the way that it was structured was that there was a sort of welfare system before welfare was ever designed. The Lord, because he has a heart for those who are going through bad times and haven't got enough, wrote into his law a system whereby you weren't allowed to harvest all the way to the edge of your field. You had to leave a gap around the outside so that the poor and the destitute had a means that if they got themselves into a jam to be able to go and find something so that they could eat and have a meal. Do we see that? So there's an understanding that if you'd got an honourable clan leader, he would honour that, but plenty of them didn't. Effectively, it was like a businessman being asked to voluntarily surrender some of their profits to be used as part of the Lord's purpose to uphold the broken and the needy. Oh, they start to go out and get it. That's a great idea of a welfare system, isn't it? Don't just give the free handouts. Provide a means for people in their dignity to help them in their point of desperation. And, but what, do you notice what she asks for? She asks for more than that, doesn't she? What does she ask for, cheeky little beggar? What does she ask for? She doesn't ask, just ask to be able to go and pick up the leftovers and go and glean on, on, right round the edges. What does she ask for? She asks to go right to the front of the queue, cheeky little madam. She's like, can I go and glean among the harvesters? Please, I need food for me and Naomi. Would you allow me? I know it's a bit cheeky. I'm asking to be pushed to the front of the queue. And so this foreman reports this to Boaz, and that makes his eyebrow raise to go, wow, she's really trying to move in the direction of, of, of making something of this situation. So verse 7, she went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the, shield, in the shelter. And as Boaz hears that, he sees and, and is drawn to something of a daring to believe, a seeking after. Ruth has been mobilized to move in the direction of putting herself in a place where grace will come back at her. So verse 8, so Boaz, he actually goes and seeks her out. Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field because that one might not be safe. And don't go away from here. Stay with my servant girls because I know you're going to be looked after. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I've told the men not to touch you. Um, whenever you are thirsty, go and get a, a drink from the water jars the men have filled. In other words, I'm inviting you into the safety that I provide. I've got an eye on you. You've got a future. You'll be safe here. Come under the shelter of my wing. Receive everything that is good and safe. Know that protection the things that you would fear won't touch you here because this is my domain. And then we come to the question of the whole passage. Verse 10. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She explained, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you... What's it say? She's been. And why is this a shock to her? Because she's a, what's it say? A foreigner. 
Now, this isn't about discrimination. This is against allegiance. She was an enemy of the people of God, but she has come near to the influence of the God of the Bible and found somebody of standing who echoes the character of God. And what's the word she uses to describe it? Favor. You know what favor is? It's not doing you a favor. It's somebody with a posture of grace that moves towards you that you may have a better future with you having nothing to offer. Nothing at all. It is the fairy tale story of the prince who comes from a distant nation to the pauper girl. And for nothing in her, because she doesn't look like Cinderella, says, I'm going to make you my queen. And she bows down low. It's actually a a word tied up with the idea of worship. She prostrates herself down because she's staggered. I'm a widow. I've got no family. I'm not marketable in the eyes of the world. Why would you do this for me? Why would you notice? This is unthinkable. I'm an enemy. Are any of you guys who've been around here long enough beginning to get a uh, a sense of what this story is an echo of? A small imitation of a greater one. Oh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 11, Boaz replies, I've been told about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you do not know. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you richly be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. In other words, she has dared to believe, she's come near to the possibility of grace under this God. And the Lord says, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, that's all you're going to get. No, he he lavishes it upon people. We see this again and again in scripture. The Lord Jesus himself said, to those who have, they will be given more. But to those who have not, i.e. they're moving away from knowing him as their king, even what they have will be taken away. There's this principle in place that as as people draw near to the grace of God, he wants to give them more. A little action of faith opens you up to more and more and more, and it's so much more than she could possibly have imagined. And she says, may I continue to find find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servants, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. Do you notice what isn't at uh, present here? That sort of religious spirit that we all fear, that judges, that when somebody sees a, a bad side to you, they cancel you or kick you to the curb. Boaz doesn't turn up and say, well, if you promise to be here on time, I might better find an opening for you. No conditions, just lavish grace. Come and receive what you've been daring to believe might be true. Now, why is this story here in the Old Testament? It's to tell us and echo to us a greater story. It tells us of the character of God. What do we see Boaz here doing? We see him doing beautiful things. He seeks out somebody to bring into his family. Does that sound familiar? He seeks them out. And now she gets referred to almost as if Not as an enemy, but almost as if she's thoroughly in the family. She's not an outcast anymore because somebody who echoes the living God shows us what that looks like. Boaz seeks out outcasts as if they are family. He seeks to shelter the weak, those who've got no means of their own. He serves the hungry at their table, at his table, which is what we're going to see next week. He showers the needy with his grace. And all they need in that moment, not even aware up to this point that that is what the true God of the Bible is like, just living out the existence as if this isn't the case, it suddenly becomes personally available to her and she loves it. Absolutely loves it. So what are we to see in this? 
I think as I try and summarise and move us towards the end of this, I think there's three things that I want us to see. The first thing is the situation. The situation is one that feels in the moment hopeless, but only if you leave God out of the picture. Have you any idea how close he is? Repeatedly through scripture, we see again and again how the God of the Bible is one who sees personally and cares and is working something out that we know very little about. Now, what will be the direction of travel? Please don't hear me saying, come near to God and he will give you your fairy tale. No, quite often what's happening is he's dismantling your fairy tale because it is vain, empty, self-seeking and puny. And what he is doing is, is dismantling that that you might be ready to draw down on his fairy tale centered on who Jesus is, for his glory and for, his, for the good of his people, he wants you to be caught up into the Redeemer and who Jesus is. And the great thing about this Redeemer is in the midst of our situation, he is always pre- present. Please can we be the people, not just who when stuff happens to us say, what might, be the, what might the Lord be doing in this, but go one step deeper than that. Not as an intellectual exercise to try and figure out just because it gives us an extra layer or veneer of controllability because we can understand it. We want to be the people who push in the moments of difficulty to very quickly say, I know he is here. I know he is doing something. Please help me to rest in his presence with me. How do you do that? We be people who first thing in the morning, we fill ourselves up with his great, his great and precious promises from his word. We want to be saturated with words of promise about him and who he is so that we're instinctively looking at and evaluating our experiences with an assumption that he is there in presence. Maybe the very first thing that you can do to grow in that is simply be the kind of person who's, who when they next meet either a believer or an unbeliever is, may the Lord bless you. He's heavily present. He's the silent witness of every conversation. He's here. This isn't just between us. We have this sense that the Lord is very present. So the first thing was to see your circumstances. The second thing, and third, are linked, is to find out which character you are. We all have to be a Ruth. The problem is, is that we want to be noticed, we want to be validated, we want to be seen, we want to not be invisible to all the wrong places. Those things light us up. If we're somebody who likes to be invisible, we'll secretly dream of being somebody who seems in their own strength to be much more visible. We'll clamour, not for attention as in intention seeking, but we'll clamour to be somebody. Don't you realise... This story is telling us that you are more noticed, more known, you matter more than you can possibly imagine. Oh, and by the way, it's before the only set of eyes that really matter. And he has the power, the clout, the goodness, the steadfastness to deliver. We should be like, whoa! Imagine if, I don't know, somebody rich and famous decides to take you under their wing, be your mentor, provide for you, write a check to say, however good or bad you are, whatever you're facing, I've got you. Who would you pick? Puny. Do you know who has got our back? We should bow down. 
how is it that I have found such favour? A favour bought for me by Jesus Christ, and he's the one who's guaranteed that as much as I kick and fight against him, he's going to be faithful to me. Not only has he forgiven my sin, but he has given me a place at the table. I'm in the family. Only his, his veil and shield of protection is upon me. The enemy can only get me as much as, as he allows. I'm in. Can you imagine what that would be like if we walked that out tomorrow? You, you know, whether you work into war, uh, walk into work or connect online or wherever you go, you'll be marching in feeling, don't you know who I am? I've found favor. I've been noticed. But of course we exchange that for lesser ones, don't we? Right now there is a God in heaven who just wants to come alongside you and give you a massive hug and say, have you no idea what I've done for you and how committed to you I am? Stop messing around with things that just don't matter. I love you. In my son, I love you. So you're supposed to walk around every day as Ruth. You are noticed. You are seen. He has regarded you. But I think as well, we're supposed to be Boaz. Somebody remind me, what did Boaz do? Shout out a few sentences. What did Boaz do? Greet to the people with reference to the Lord. Good. What else did he do? Look after them. He sought out the outsider who didn't have access to what he did as an echo of the character of God and he was intentional and purposeful about it. So there are people in our church family who came to Moab in speak. Moved in. I'm going to be a presence for Jesus there. I realize that there are people in our community who haven't got a clue about who Jesus is. They're outside the plans and grace of God. And they could do it their own way and live for their own self-interest, but instead they mobilized to share their lives, what they've got of who Jesus is, that they may be blessed. They're investing in moving out to give away who Jesus is. Why do you think I asked Joe to talk about Rooted today? Because that's what those Rooted workers are doing. Do you want to work with teenagers? Not a very thankful bunch. Maybe you should, to teach your own heart a lesson that because I've received from the Lord, I want to, I want to be a Boaz. I love our cafe. It, just, it, it, it gives stuff away to welcome people in. In your own family life and, and in your working life, your relational life, you won't simply be trying to gather to people who add value to your vision for you. You will be generously thinking about how do I let people in on what I've got? I want them to know this Lord. We will be aggressive in that. And so there's only really one song that we can sing as we finish. Can anybody think what it might be? It's got a line in all about this. Anybody got, I'll give you a clue, it's the word regarded. Anybody got any idea? Claire's giggled to herself, you've got it, haven't you? No? Go on, tell us why. The Lord has regarded my helpless estate. You can sing this however you like, except for one rule. When it gets to that line, double the volume. Let's stand and sing together. Mm -hmm.